Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Stephanie Weisberg, and I am the Associate Curator at the Pulitzer Arts Foundation. Uh, welcome to tonight's program, Artist and Isolation. Um, I'm just going to say a few words before I hand it over to our distinguished panelists. Um, this discussion was organized in relationship to the Pulitzer's current exhibition, Assembly Required, which looks at artworks that invite the direct participation of the public and create platforms for social exchange. Uh, the exhibition opens at a moment when people are really coming together after a long period of isolation. And as a meditation on this time period, it felt apt to ask questions about the relationship between loneliness and solitude and productive creative exchange. Um, our distinguished panelists, Samantha Hill, Madeline Tien, and Paul Holdengraber will discuss these ideas. And I'm just gonna offer some brief introductions before I hand it over to them. Samantha Rose Hill is the author of Hannah Arendt, uh, which was published in 2021, and Hannah Arendt's poems forthcoming in 2023. She's a senior fellow at the Hannah Arendt Center for Politics and Humanities and associate faculty at the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research. Madeline Tien is a professor at Brooklyn College and the author of four books of fiction. Her recent novels have focused on art, politics, and revolution most notably in Cambodia and China. She's received Canada's two highest literary honors, the Giller Prize and the Governor General's Literary Award for Fiction. Her writing is known for the intimacy which it delves into 20th century history in Asia and its embrace of mathematics, the sciences and music. Paul Holdengraber is an interviewer and curator. He is the founding executive director of Onassis Los Angeles. Previously, and for 14 years, he was founder and director of the New York Public Library's Live at the New York Public Library Cultural Series, where he interviewed, it, interviewed and hosted over 600 events. So without further ado, I will hand it over to our panelists to get the conversation going. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for the introductions and thank you so much Maddie and Paul for agreeing to have this conversation together about loneliness. Um, I want to I want to start us with a quote uh, of course from Hannah Arendt and it's not really a quote so much as it's something that she wrote in a letter to Mary McCarthy um, in the 50s and she said I've had a hard time getting used to the world again also I'm just a plain bit tired and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, as we dive into a conversation about loneliness and isolation and imagination and creativity, how both of you have been getting used to the world again over the past few months. Paul, do you want to go ahead? Do I want to go ahead? <laughs> Why not? Why not? Um, getting used to the world again. I think, I think one of the, the big issues now is that we're going back to what, to what passes for normal. And uh, there is this idea in some sense that we may have learned something from this moment of isolation, that we may have changed. And I'm, I'm wondering really quite deeply at this moment, if anything really has changed. And if when we go back to the world we left, we find a really different world. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what, what it means to, to go back to the world and what it means to go back to the world after this moment where we have been in forced isolation. Yeah, I think I've been thinking those things too. And but but on a personal level, I I came out of I'd spent the pandemic in Montreal, um, and then I came back to New York to to do a fellowship at New York Public Library. And I must say that the joy of being around other people was I, I I've always been kind of a reserved maybe socially awkward <laughs> person and I was amazed at the pure delight I felt in seeing people and being with them on this daily basis and the appetite I felt for it and I think um, 
something that I felt in the last little while is just that the difficulty of moving towards and away from people as we sort of open and close and take precaution and take care of each other. And then I'm, you know, I'm a novelist, so I'm kind of isolated in general. So I find, I'm finding the movement between togetherness and aloneness or solitude more challenging than before. Hmm. I love that word appetite. I felt voracious. <laughs> I just wanted to look at people's faces and I, I want to see them move their whole body, you know, not just <laughs> this part. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and, and um, <clears throat> what we've come to realize, I think so much is how much we need to be touched. Hmm you know, to be touched by other people in, in every sense of the word. And, and when, we're, when we're not, we, we really feel alone. I think they call it touch hunger now is the, is the term that's uh, being used. But it does, it does feel like everyone's eyes are a bit wider right now in a certain way, that there's a kind of different appetite but I in finding I don't know if a balance can ever really be found in that movement between appearance and aloneness but I feel like I almost gorged myself on sociality in the past few months um, and now feel a very strong need to 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 pull back and and I'm wondering if there might even be a nostalgia moving forward for those first few months when we just got to go inward home and, and isolate um, with ourselves. Um, I, I it, it's it might be too early to say. No. You no, know, we we we're, we're at a strange distance from what has happened because it's still ongoing. Um, you know, we 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 are in the presence of other people, but we also are still somewhat liabilities to each other. And we don't have quite enough of a historical distance to really evaluate what we've been going through. Um, but the idea of nostalgia here is very interesting, of course, in the etymological sense of the word nostalgia, which is really a, a, a deep longing uh, for home, a, a, nearly a sickness for home, a, a desire to be back there. And I think we, we, we constantly negotiate the right distance between being with ourselves and being with others. And I, I think of it um, in terms of what Winnicott said so beautifully when he said that the goal for the child is to be alone in the presence of the mother, which always seemed to me so important and such an important way of thinking about what it means to be at the right remove. And alone in the presence of, mother, of the mother, for me, has always been the best definition of reading. We're, we're alone, but we're nurtured. Mm -hmm. And so how there's do we- There's a lot hung on the word alone there, though, Paul. Pardon? Yeah. There's a lot hung on the word alone there, and a, and a lot of expectation on the, on the mother uh, as, as well. Um, I want to, since um, it didn't come up in the introductions, I also, I just want to, you know, you both have been so productive during the past two years. Paul, you started the quarantine tapes um, and you've been talking to people every single day. Right. <laughs> and Maddie, you're in the middle of writing this incredible novel that has a lot to do with isolation and the movement between the inside and the outside. So I don't want our conversation to slip away without hearing a little bit about um, both of those uh, projects as well. Well, um, Maddie, shall I, shall I start? Yes, please. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start very quickly by saying, indeed, uh, Sam, Samantha, I, I started the quarantine tapes on, um, on the 23rd or 24th of March. Also very interesting to my mind that all these dates um, are very much imprinted in our minds. We all know that the 11th, 12th, 13th of March is when the world changed at least for a while because of the pandemic. These, these dates have become incredibly important for all of us. And so I started 
the quarantine tapes as a chronicle of our time, not knowing at all, like everybody, how long this would last. And two plus years later, 300 shows later, I've spoken on a daily basis until very recently to people every single day, uh, sort of asking them, where are you? What are you thinking? Uh, you know, asking Roseanne Cash what she was thinking, or Werner Herzog what he was thinking, or, or um, David Harrington what he was thinking. I mean, all kinds of different people, um, Sonny Rollins, Henry Rollins, all these different people, asking them what they were thinking during this period. And for many of the writers, obviously, life was not that different. Um, they were very well prepared and very well versed at being alone. It was only exacerbated by the fact that when they were no longer alone in a room and they went outside, they, there was nobody to see. But they, they had learned, they had learned through their practice how to be alone. So for me, doing that was a way of, of taking the temperature of this moment trying to figure out you know, what will emerge from it and listening back to some of those tapes as I have, it is interesting to see um, the despair of some and the hope of others. Okay. And I know that for you, Samantha, in particular, the notion of hope is very interesting, but there, there were many, you know, Bernie Krauss who's recorded 40,000 hours of sounds in nature was very hopeful that we would learn to live differently and that the birds he was hearing 20, that he hadn't heard 20, for 25 years were coming back and wouldn't that teach us to be in a different state with the environment. So it's, it's been an incredible journey, uh, journey for me and, and perhaps for the listeners to, to hear you know, to hear what people have been thinking during this period of time. Mm. Um, I was, you know, as normal working on this giant novel that does kind of wild things with time and um, I'm experimenting with ideas around time and space and is it possible to create a building made of time so I, it was fascinating to work on it during the pandemic while being held still um, and you know when you're writing a novel there's all this this motion and it's just that strange thing of the writer being still but this incredible motion that's happening on all these different levels and um i know that i i i am not generally an optimistic person but there is a part of me that optimistically feels that we have been changed even if we don't yet realize it um not everyone was made to stand still a lot of people were working like crazy still running around on behalf of others um, for me, I think that spring of 2020 is, I almost feel like I experienced spring for the first time, just being held in place and watching it mm -hmm. from the balcony or the yard or the sidewalk day after day. Um, you know, the way you would look at people's expressions, the way you used to watch crowds going by in the street, the way you'd sit in a cafe and look at people. Well, now it, all that attention for me poured into the, the sky, the trees and the and what was happening around me. And I, I, I do think this was something that happened in many different pockets of the world um, and mourning. I also think maybe we don't know what's changed because we haven't really mourned what happened during the pandemic. I mean, the, the loss of life is staggering and ongoing and, and the flow through of it all too. So I, I I feel like we're in such a precarious moment, whether we'll remember what we went through or whether we won't. Yeah. One of the questions that I, I've received a lot over the past year via email is, did Hannah Arendt ever write about um, surviving the plague? Mm -hmm. Because she would have been around 12 or 13 years old and it's not even a blip in her biography. Um, you know, and also ongoing. And I, I think there's part of me um, eschewing hope as usual, 
that worries that even though this has changed us, I'm not sure it's changed us for the better. And 20, 30, 50 years from now, um, many of the people, my, you know, younger than me, um, won't even really um, take it into account in their own kind of self-authored biography of, of this time in their life. Samantha, um, I, I feel like the question you asked of us, I want to ask it of you. What was the question I asked? <laughs> you know, the, the busyness of these last two years and what we've been doing and um, how, how, this, how you've been living through this moment. And yeah. in, a, in a sense, it's a different question than when I had you on the quarantine tapes, which is more than a year ago. And now we're slowly emerging, uh, perhaps. And at a distance, you probably can evaluate these last two years, which have been tremendous for you in terms of uh, professional changes. <laughs> yeah, yes, um, you know, what Maddie, what Maddie, what you were saying about kind of sitting at the window and, and really kind of fixing um, attention on nature deeply resonates with me. It's when the, when the pandemic started and, and early, well, February, really, I think late January, February, but in early March, as things began to close down and we were talking about going online at Bard College, um, I started um, taking a two mile walk every day to uh, an estate near my house, um, which has beautiful gardens and uh, in upstate New York. And I was very lucky to have that space during the pandemic where I could go and walk. And I went and I, every day and I did the same exact walk and I would go sit on the exact same bench and I took a picture every day to see how um, things were blooming and one day I was reading a book and I just realized that I had to change everything um, and I wrote in the back of the book it was March 12th I had been doing this for almost two weeks and I made a timeline for myself leave Bard uh, stop writing about Hannah Arendt, <laughs> start working on what I want to work on. And I, I, I took measures to even further isolate myself. So I was completely alone because I really wanted to use the time to kind of cocoon, to imagine and reimagine what I was doing. Since at that point I had been teaching undergrads for 15 years, which was really hard to believe. And, um, I even went a step further and spent the summer on a Greek island where nobody was <laughs> to be completely alone to write my first book. Um, so it's been, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate the past two years um, and it's, it's given me that critical distance and time to really step back in my own life. Um, and um, it's also been incredibly difficult. You know, I think I, I clocked I think I went four months without touching another human being at one point. Um, and my cat ran away like two oh. months before the pandemic started and he never came home, you know? So I was just like totally isolated in the woods, which was really good for me. It was really, I mean, for me creatively, that's a long answer, Paul, but that's the, it, it was pivotal for me. It gave me the space and in, in my imagination to rethink my own life. Um, and I was fortunate enough to have the resources and friends to do that. There, there is this, you know, I, I think I mentioned this earlier, this negotiation where we're trying to work with, of being with other people and being alone. And uh, as you know, uh, Samantha, I have a, a great fondness, which I think you share for, for Walter Benjamin. And um, in, in, in preparing to talk with, with both of you today and have this trialogue uh, that we're attempting to have now, um, I, I went back and, and read an essay by Adorno on oh, yeah. Benjamin as a letter writer. And it's a beautiful, beautiful essay. Um, 
a tremendous essay in, in my view, because uh, Benjamin and Adorno wrote a lot of letters to each other, maybe not quite as many as Benjamin wrote to Gershom Scholem, but there be there's a beautiful passage, which I want to read to both of you. It's very, very short and have you react to it. And I can add some reactions to it too. It, he simply says this, the letter suited him, suited Benjamin so well, because it predisposes to mediated immediacy. And I, I, I love that term, mediated immediacy. It creates that, that, that sense of being together, but nevertheless being apart. Maddie, I see you looking up sort of as if for inspiration. Well, I just had this image pop into my head of the letter writer and the recipient together in a vessel, you know, some sort of floating glass <laughs> where they meet in this in this space. Um, I maybe was thinking that because I think Sam had just said something about, about the space of the ima imagination and how that that line between the letter writer and the person they're trying to draw near um, creates this other dimension. Yeah. It's, um, I had, I immediately had the image of Benny Mean uh, walking on the beach in Ibiza um, and writing to Gretel Adorno, who he corresponded with far more than, than Theodore, I believe. Um, but, you know, Adorno liked that word immediacy and minima moralia, he says that we cannot wither under the weight of immediacy. So the, the mediation, that bit of distance afforded by the letter for Adorno is necessary for a critical perspective, but for Benjamin, it was erotic. Um, and I immediately think of the preface to the origin of German tragic drama, where he talks about how Eros is always in flight, much like a letter, the letter that's sent in the mail on the way to the recipient. And, you know, the letter writing for Benjamin was a matter of survival. It was, a, for him, it was about ensuring often that his work would live um, because yeah. he always felt him, for a long time, he felt himself so very near to death. And so he, you know, when he sends the theses on the philosophy of history to Gretel, he has that beautiful sentence that, you know, here is a bouquet of withering flowers. Um, and we feel the immediacy in his handwriting, that tiny, sharp scrawl. He had no paper. I mean, he, it's this so, he's writing so intensely. Um, and, you know, I wonder if the letter writing if, if either of you partook of the, the pandemic letter writing, um, if the letter writing in the past couple of years hasn't been so so much mediated immediacy so much as the chance to to pause and take a breath. For me, it, sadly, I haven't written letters, but what I've done more than ever before, which is something that I used to do as well, but have done so much more of, is picked up the phone. The, the the phone, which I think until quite recently was rather exotic. <laughs> you, know, you had to tell people when you would call and you had to make an appointment. We've changed our modalities of calling, but the pandemic afforded the notion that one wanted to hear the grain of the of the voice. One wanted again to have some kind of a relationship with another person and a voice, of course, and the intonation of a voice is so personal. And since we couldn't, as Maddie, you were saying, you, you had such hunger to see people. I had hunger to hear people. I had hunger to know there are other people. We're not alone. I sent little parcels during the pandemic with short letters, little parcels. Um, but I found something interesting, which is that when someone wrote to me, I, it took me a long time to open the letter. I needed, I couldn't just, it didn't arrive in the mail and I would open it. I just, it was like, I had to be ready to receive the letter. Sometimes it would take me two weeks to open it. Like, 
Um, and it, it, when Paul was talking about the phone, it made me nostalgia long a little bit for the phone that was attached to the wall that you had to go to. Right. You know, that portal that you went to, that you opened it up and then you could, you know, enter through the back of the wardrobe door or something. It was something like the fact that we carry it around and it seems so available in for me emotionally has made it weirdly less available. Um, whereas I'm, I remember as a teenager, that thing we used to do where you would, you know, fall, fall asleep on the phone talking to someone or you would pull the phone <laughs> into bed, you know, remember that? <laughs> those things and the cord and everything that cord was so like you know I just yeah felt you felt connected Sam you know when you were talking about Arendt and and the pandemic and and that it's not even a blip in her biography it made me actually think about Spinoza who's someone I've been writing uh -huh. about and of course he he suffered through great great waves of the pandemic and lost a number of friends and members of his family died not from from plague or anything but early on in his life um and that's what I mean I was thinking about that we don't know the effect of the change because I I do feel part of Spinoza's ethics is written in the vein of trying to find that ability to have equilibrium to love the world to know there's an ethic somewhere within us um because of what he saw in the world around him, not disconnected from it. So I do wonder what will arise philosophically, um, <laughs> you know, from this moment, it may not come for, for many decades, but it, it does feel like for people who have been in very close contact with this kind of pandemic, um, they're going to give us something. That's, that's my feeling that may last much, much longer than we can imagine now. I, I think, the, I wonder if it, you know, you're thinking so much about time, Maddie, and, and I hear that in, in part of what you've been saying, I think, but, and I, I'm wondering if it's going to reorient the way people think about, I mean, we can't even, it's hard to even talk about time without employing a vocabulary of economy or capitalist economy. So how do you spend your time? How do you use your time? How is your time productive? And I'm wondering if that vocabulary of time and the way that we attach meaning to time might shift moving forward, or if we're just gonna be cycled back into this kind of endlessly laboring economy of productivity where everything feels so determinate. It's wonderful that we're, we're the three of us are pausing here. <laughs> Either that or it was a really bad. Uh, no, no, no. I, <laughs> I, I, I think we, we took our time here. Mm. I know there's an urge to slow down. As if, as if it's a, nearly a, a necessity. Um, at least I feel it. I think there's that. I think I'm also thinking about people's unwillingness to return to work, mm -hmm. the great resignation, um, how we spend our days. Maybe it's time for you know a, a rewriting of Hesiod's days and works um, and what people are eager to do, what they're willing to do, what they're hungry to do right now. Um, but there, there's certainly the, I think also a desire for a certain kind of slowness, which is necessary for thinking, um, at least in, in an Arendtian sense, and even a, a Beniminian sense. Um, my favorite, one of my favorite quotes of his is that the, the mode most proper to contemplation is the pausing for breath. Um, this, and, and I wonder actually if the, if the pandemic, if this time has actually made that worse, because um, I've been busier than ever. 
you're talking to people every day, Paul. Uh, Maddie, as a writer, you're perhaps occupying a little bit of a different space, but we're using the technology to mediate our daily lives in a way so that we're hardly ever fully alone, even when we are alone with ourselves. It's such a hard question to answer because um, like I definitely feel like I am in a slower state of mind, but that's also conditions of my life at, at the moment. Um, but I, I, I feel that something has accelerated in the last I feel like our politics is accelerating. I feel like there's just no, like res, there's no there is no breath, and I'm just trying to put those two states of mind together because I do think on the one hand it's true people are are wanting to pull back and people are wanting to like you know make a major shift in their lives in keeping with the, the major shifts that are happening globally, and yet at the same time. There's this reactive, instinctive, quick, quick, quick that is like a, a rhythm of the mind that hmm. our societies can't get out of, habituated, we're habituated to it. Hmm. An impatience. Impatience and, uh, you know, that appetite word again, of always wanting something to happen, of needing something, some kind of spectacle, some kind of crisis, of some kind of... I, I, I do wonder if we're hooked on crisis, and I mean, it is a, there is there are major crises, no question. It's they're in a crisis moment, but people seem to be feeding off it too. I don't know what I'm trying to say exactly. I'm still yeah. thinking it through. It I'm, makes I'm, I'm wondering. I'm wondering also in in terms of our conversation here and how it connects to this exhibition. Uh, that the Pulitzer Arts Foundation has on, which I, I have to admit I haven't sadly seen. Um, I'm wondering, uh, maybe Samantha, how uh, how to articulate this, I, I think in, in Arendt's vocabulary, this idea that um, we, we, we need in some way to be in contact with in order to to act and to be together and um, and and when not together, what happens? And of course, Arendt, Arendt wrote about that beautifully and quoted, quoted as I remember Cicero in particular in that context. But I'm wondering if we can, uh, for the purpose of this moment, somehow articulate part of what we're saying in relation to what the Pulitzer Arts Foundation is trying to do. Yes, I, so I like that you corrected Arendt's a miscitation of, of Cato and, and rightly attributed the fact that uh, we are, we, what, is, what is it? We are, um, you know, never are we less alone than when we are alone with ourselves, which is how she ends the human condition. Yeah, so there's two different sides at play here. One, the exhibition in person brings to life which is Arendt's conception, that action um, is spontaneous and happens in concert with others. We can't act alone. And the other is the need for isolation in order to engage in creative activity. And uh, importantly for Arendt, the solitude uh, that's necessary for thinking. And you can be isolated without being lonely and lonely without being isolated. And in terms of creative um, space for thinking and being alone pleasurably in harmony with oneself, Arendt emphasizes the need to be uh, kind of isolated, to withdraw from the world of appearances, um, to be alone with the self. And so I, I went to the exhibition a week or two ago, I can't remember now. <laughs> and, I, it was so wonderful. I left my computer there um, and my manuscript and my notebook. Um, but you, you, you required another person uh, to, to, most of the exhibits required two or more people um, to kind of bring them to life. So it was um, a kind of in action 
uh, exhibit and or a prompt to do something in the world with others. And so, you know, in, in thinking about this conversation about isolation and how isolation can nourish uh, creativity, um, I, I thought of you two, obviously, um, and the work that you've, you've been doing. Maddie, one question I, I've been thinking about to kind of build off this, um, you know, you, you aren't, can I talk about your book a little bit? Can I, so Arendt is a character in your book. Walter Benjamin is a character in your book and you bring them to life. I'm wondering if those interlocutors in your imagination have changed at all under the conditions of isolation. Mm. I'm sure the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> But I started the, the novel six years ago, and it's, you know, it's Spinoza, Arendt, and uh, the Chinese poet Du Fu, and they're always, like, hanging out on the one, this the one floor of this building, and <laughs> um, I feel like the stoppages of the last couple of years, I hope. I hope they made me a better listener. Well, I think there was a concentration that I found at not throughout, you know, these past few years, but in moments of it that I had never really experienced before, partly from the loneliness, I think real loneliness, not not just solitude, um, where they became my friends <laughs> because I was in conversation with them every single day for long hours at a time and I was I was eavesdropping on them in conversation with each other um and they were that wonderful feeling of making you know that they are actually remaking you that's that conundrum of the making um so I think the answer is yes I think it will be very I think one thing I'm 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 experiencing now is the difficulty of letting them go I think it's partly why part of me thinks well maybe it's just a thousand page novel <laughs> but I think that's a problem of, of letting go they've been such good companions um for me um so every every day for for a long time I had this show uh, called the quarantine tapes, which I continue on a, on a less regular basis now. Um, but every day now, what I do is because, as I often say, I'm a quotomaniac by profession. I I find a quotation that I love, and I recite it in my inimitable way. And um, there is one such quotation that I want to read back to you. Uh, because I think it, it it speaks in one form or another, or I hope it speaks in one form or another to our our conversation here. And it's a, a quotation by, by the philosopher Martin Buber. And Martin Buber says the following, I do indeed close my door at times and surrender myself to a book, but only because I can open the door again and see a human being looking back at me. And I'm wondering how that resonates for both of you. I, I saw Samantha going, Whoo. so maybe <laughs> Samantha, what, what, is, what is your reaction to that? Oh, I'm, I am so introverted. I am so uh, solitary. Um, you know, the, it, that quote echoes off of the Winnicott quote that you cited earlier, which I, that quote's odd. Um, but I, I think I, 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 for me, it's knowing that nobody else is on the other side of the door that allows me to really sink in to the book that I'm reading or the essay that I'm writing. Um, as long as there's somebody else 
the possibility of interruption exist. And that means that my attention is split in some way. Um, but the other side of that is, you know, public spaces. I think the loss of public spaces for creative activity for reading at, at a bar in a cafe or writing in a cafe has been a real loss. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Uh, Maddie, how, how does it resonate for you? I'm, I'm fascinated by uh, Samantha's reaction and have a lot to say about it, but I want to hear, <laughs> I, I want to hear what, you, what you have to say. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm just going to poke my head up in this and, well, and then well, let I'm, you go. I'm, I'm going to slide I'm, under the desk now. I'm, 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 I'm only believing Samantha half there, but go ahead. I love the quote. I think my experience of it is that one doesn't shut the book, that when the um, when the person appears on the other side, you've actually, it's like because you've walked, you know, you've walked through the book in a way. And then so as you meet the person who would have been on the other side of the door that you opened, um, it's not that the book was put away. It, it's that, 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 they are now layered together. So when I meet the person I've opened the door for, I am also carrying the the writer who was with me for however how many minutes or hours that was. And this I I I like the cumulative the the cumulatory <laughs> is that a word the cumulative effect. Of you know, I think in the case of Booba, I mean, I know I know too little to know something. But I think in the in the case of Buba, there is this there is a Jewish element which is very important here, which is that we are, you know, the, the book is not a palliative to life. Um, it's not instead of, and it's not a a barrier to the outside world. Uh, the book is a tool actually for learning, but also a tool for action. And I think all of that is included in, in what he's saying. And, you know, in, in, in another way, going into another direction, I think of one of the most beautiful essays ever written in any language. Um, it's a small, tiny little essay that uh, Marcel Proust wrote on reading. Uh, it was an essay he wrote on reading um, a text by uh, John Ruskin, which was itself a text on reading. So it's on reading, on reading. And he talks about those moments when he was interrupted, to use Samantha's uh, language, interrupted reading something because his aunt or his mother or someone would interrupt his reading so that he needed to go and have lunch. And what remains so powerful um, in that, in, in remembering and recollecting that moment is less the book that he read than those interruptions, than those moments where it, it locates his reading. There's a geography of reading that happens. The, the interruptions in a way become nearly the memory of the reading of the book. Um, so in, in some way, the book is in conversation with its surroundings. And again, this is the, the question that I'm constantly asking myself, the, the negotiation between being alone and in a way, reading is, is a way of, of peopling one's solitude. Mm. Baudelaire, no. Um, but I think... I, and, and what I hear in Maddie saying is, I, I love the Proustian geography and the location of the event um, in relationship to what one is reading. But in what Maddie was saying, I also hear a kind of porosity, a more fluidity between being in, I mean, if I only have to open the door once a week, that's fine for me. And then I can carry all of that reading. <laughs> <laughs> with me into conversation. Um, but that's, I think that's different somehow. The book isn't, and, and maybe there's too much aren't in my head here in a way, 
but when we read, we don't, I mean, we can leave the world. I forget where I am all the time when I'm reading or writing um, and, and who's around or what's going on in the world around me. But the world is, is there and there's, there's a, they're woven together. There's a kind of porousness there, which I think is a little bit different than the, than the kind of, what's the word? The, um, I don't know, the, to be, you know, to provoke a memory, to, to spark a memory, to set off a memory. Yes, and it, I, it, it so much depends on the kind of text it is. Like I, I, I one of my happiest memories is, um, I had spent, I was months in Shanghai and I would just get on these buses. I had no idea where they were going. I would just get on a bus and just ride it to the end and turn, turn around and get back and ride it, you know, so, so sometimes for several hours a day, or I would take the train 40 hours to the, to the West of China and always with a audio book because I didn't want to be looking down. I always wanted to be looking out. So I, I listened to all of remembrance of things past while watching Shanghai streets. Um, and they, in my memory and my experience, they now are totally inter intermeshed. And actually, it was almost a perfect combination. There was something about the rhythm of life and the detail and the particularities everywhere and the drama um, that I was seeing around me that felt so much in tune as if they had stepped into that same same space. I, I think it's different if you're reading, you know, like like Heidegger, then you really need this intent. You can't, like the knock you, on the door is very... You're reading Heidegger, you really want to look down. <laughs> you have to actually get in the book. <laughs> but if it's a novel, you know, if it's poetry, if it's, then I think it can accompany you in a, it, it, it just accompanies you in a different way. You know, that's so fantastic. Maddie, I, I, I think your, your reading of Proust in that way by listening to him uh, will remain now uh, my vicarious memory of how one can possibly read. <laughs> I'm already having fantasies about train rides and which audiobooks I'm going to take in right. which country. Yes, yes. No, it's a wonderful idea. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the subjects um, that the Pulitzer Art Foundation was, was hoping we would address was this notion of how how isolated do we need to be to be creative mm -hmm. um and and given that i chat for a living but you actually both of you write uh, for a living in one form or another i'm i'm wondering how you 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 answer that question or you begin to think about that question how much is enough and how much is too much and how much is needed and what is needed? What are the what are the conditions under which we we do not flourish? Or what, what are the are... conditions for chatting for a living? <laughs> do you require no isolation? I'll, I'll I'll tell you what what is most important there um, is is what Maddie was saying. She she's improved during this period, which is really really listening, really listening, and really not thinking about what the next question will be. Because if you do, um, you get in your own way terribly. And and I, you know, I do believe that speaking is 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 a is a form of discovery. But I, I will come back to my question to both of you, which is, um, you know, Samantha shrewdly changed <laughs> that, you know, but talking, let's forget the chatting and talking for you, this, this moment and this moment perhaps has exacerbated or maybe put in, in, in relief or put on, on relief, put further the idea that, that one one needs a, 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 a certain amount of of um, of distance and isolation and solitude, however you wish to call it. And these terms, of course, are, are both fluid and different. And I'm just I'm just curious how how you think about that. 
Maddie, let's start with you. I think it's hard for me to answer because I think that I um, I don't don't have a mind that can be constantly engaged. I think one of the 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 failings of it's just when I'm writing a novel, it just it just becomes everything I see and touch. So it's not even it doesn't always feel like a choice of whether that I need to be isolated in order to to write it. It's that I can't get out of it. Um, which makes me a very unreliable corresponder <laughs> because sometimes I just go under or go within or in, inside it for a long time. And I think it's a, it's a really interesting question about the habit of self-isolation that for me is a habit that I find hard to break because I take so much pleasure in how intricate the imagined world can become when you don't look away from it. It's not a good answer to the question. That's not for you to say. <laughs> it's, um, I'm thinking about the juxtaposition bet between the, the kind of, I don't, I don't even think you can really call it the quiet of radiant, but I'll say the quiet of radiant and chatting for a living because I imagine that both require forms of solitude or isolation. Um, and the, I mean, sometimes the conversation in writing alone is, is very deafening inside my head. <laughs> it's very loud. It's a different kind of chatting uh, with myself or whoever appears. That's the, that's, that's the interesting, um, thing for me always. I never know who's going to appear, um, who will suddenly start talking uh, to me, real and or imagined. Um, but I mean, there's, um, I don't, Maddie, what you're saying resonates so deeply with me. I think the happiest time in my life was probably that full month I spent almost completely alone where I could I was just immersed in my book fully. Um, and then, you know, as I wanted engaging other people out in the world, which was enough uh, in, in terms of correspondence, but that is a different, I'm wondering about the, you know, Paul, what you were saying about not thinking about the next question, I'm wondering about anticipation and isolation and expectation and how that factors into what you do as well and how you mediate that and opening um, up conversation through listening. Can I add to that question for Paul? Because I also, that really struck me and I, and I think I, I really love interviewing people and, 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 and it, that is for me the hardest part is is not having that prepared question in the back of my mind. And but what what I love about that that you're deeply listening, and then you're you can engage in that moment is the kind of element of trust that kicks in between the the two people having the conversation. You 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 do feel like you're stepping off a ledge each time. You know, like you don't I don't know what the next question is going to be, but I trust that that it's just going to land in my hands somehow. And I wondered about that for Paul. Well, waiting, waiting, and not interrupting, which includes not interrupting yourself, is so important. And discomfort is so important. I often tell my subjects that I don't mind um, if it's not a well-rounded conversation. I enjoy the edges. And the edges makes me think very much, Maddie, about what you just said, that you're about to jump off a cliff. And, you know, there, there have been these moments 
um, many times actually where um, in public when I was at the New York Public Library or on the phone now in the quarantine tapes where there, there is a real silence. And I've always asked the editors never to remove them, ever. Let it be. And there have been moments today in our conversation as well, I've noticed, where none of us was saying anything. And that can be a sign of success. Um, I, 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 I think it's really important just to wait, to let it be, as it were, and, and see what emerges. And I think that so often when you see people being interviewed, as it were, or being in conversation, which is slightly different, you, you, um, you see the, the person who, so to speak, is in charge getting terribly anxious and therefore immediately asking something and asking something of you, but also sort of getting rid of the question they have in front of them. So they can turn the page, don't turn the page, wait, wait and see. You don't know what will happen. It's exciting, it's nerve wracking. Here we are. I think that's more natural to do when you don't, you don't see the other person. I just was to remember again being on the telephone and when it's just, you know, when it's just the voice that you hear, isn't that such a different experience? Mm -hmm. And then the, the pauses and the silences don't feel like, they just feel like, part of the they just they are part they are a conversation also they have, yeah the waiting it's a very different experience a fundamentally different experience um this you know i know terry gross for instance on fresh air doesn't want to see her subjects hmm. she she even if they come to philadelphia she puts them in another room so that she doesn't become uh, distracted by their facial expressions and all of that. Um, it's her form of concentration. I personally have missed, I mean, to speak now about, I'm a rather gregarious person, unlike what Samantha claims to be. <laughs> But, but uh, you know, so I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, so, so I'm, I, I'm, I'm a rather gregarious. So I, I enjoy being in the presence of the other. And, um, you know, to quote Adam Phillips, um, he, you know, he says, you can't tickle yourself. We need other people. Um, we need other people badly. Even if we think we don't, we somehow do. But I, I know for myself, professionally speaking, being on stage and having the call and response from the audience can be magnificent. Sometimes it can be a call with absolutely no response, and then it's less magnificent. We've all, we've all experienced that as well, I'm sure, both of you and all of us. But I... And what I love, Maddie, I'm looking at you now, but I can't look at you as if we were in the same room. But if you, if ever I have the privilege of speaking to you in public, I will look straight into your eyes and I will make sure that the chair is put in such a way that I'm not looking at the audience, I'm really only focusing on you. And that, that, to my mind, is in, an incredibly powerful uh, gesture. It, it, uh, not a, it isn't a power trip at all. It's just, I, I am trying to really pay attention to everything you say. And I often say that, for me, a conversation is really bringing my entire body to the occasion, being, being embodied, not being the person who... You know, when people ask me to moderate, I say I, I don't I wouldn't know how to do it because I'm not particularly moderate. So, you know, it's really about instigating, initiating, perhaps irritating, but always being present in some form or fashion. 
I just want to say I love it. I, I do. I actually, it just reminded me how much I do love that moment on stage when you are in, con what, in conversation with someone and you're only looking at each other and it really is like you've lifted away to some other, like it, you, it has, it's true. You can forget that there are 300 or 500 or whatever number of people sitting there. You can totally, it is such a trans, transporting experience. Um, and, and it's one and it's one that is so interesting to think about now after such a long period i mean i i i have felt deprived really deprived of of that adoring public <laughs> <laughs> are you getting your public back paul well tomorrow tomorrow i'm in conversation um, with with a Mexican Peruvian writer and a, a, a translator who's also a writer, um, Mario Bellatin and David Schuch at the at the Broad Museum. And I'm really, really looking forward to just seeing what happens. Can I still do it? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure. It's been a while. Is it like riding a bicycle? Perhaps <laughs> not. <laughs> well, this might be a good natural um, stopping point. Um, we do have one question um, about different populations of people during isolation. I, I'm actually. Um, and we, we, we can take the question or we can um, or we can we can come to a close. I think, you know, Paul, one of the things that I've been curious about since you've talked to so many people who are doing so many different things is if you what what you've noticed in terms of the different different people from different countries, different places have has anything that may, that might be a way to approach the question. Mm -hmm. Well, well, to some extent, you know, what Maddie was saying early on, which is, is questions very early on, there was such a deep sense of grief huh. um, and kind of cosmic grief around the world, uh, a, a feeling of real, um, real sadness and real trauma, uh, real pain that was, was coming, coming through. Um, which I, I, you know, hearing hearing some of those conversations again, I, I realized just to what extent we were all, uh, or many people were shocked, um, and, and that that is one aspect of of uh, something that came through very very much. And there are particular conversations where it was really a, a very strong, overwhelming feeling. Other places where which to my mind are very interesting is uh, many of the people i i spoke to um felt that this is this was a natural that this should happen mm -hmm. that there was uh, uh that we we in a way the way we were living our life um the the way we were operating in the world brought this upon us which was an extraordinary thing to hear. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm considering in, in the last, last few months of calling this a quarantine tapes, what, because I don't think in a year's time, uh, the quarantine tapes should be called the quarantine tapes if I continue doing this. Um, but I'm considering uh, perhaps speaking again to some of the participants who I spoke to two years ago. So, Samantha, expect my call at some point. <laughs> and I, what I will do is I will ask the participants. And Maddie, you have to talk. Yeah, I, and Maddie, Maddie for the first time, but um, considering asking them to listen to themselves and nearly like mm -hmm. in a Michael Apted way, you know, seven years, seven up, listening and seeing how what they said back then works itself out now and what has changed and what what this passage of time has made them think about and what their hopes and expectations may have been and their anticipation of how the world would look and how prepared were they for the outcome do you have any hopes either of you for what's next 
you used the word hope. So I'm going to ask. Ready. Oh, the hardest question of all. <laughs> um, I would just like everyone to take a breath. I, I feel like, but maybe, I don't know. I, 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 I feel a great sorrow. Um, and I am not sure what the next breath will bring. I don't know either. I, I really don't know either. Um, the word hope is always a dangerous word to use in Samantha's company. <laughs> I, See what I, happens? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I, I don't know, but um, someone recently told me that Willie Nelson um, had said that if we all took care of the six or seven feet around us, we would be doing much better. So maybe, maybe that's what we need to do is just take care of our, our surroundings. Of, and, and, and also because I, I know that this is a subject that is deeply connected to the notion of isolation, solitude, um, is uh, the notion of, of friendship trying, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm wishing for more than hopeful is to dip back in, to retrieve again, to be back in touch, um, to reignite, to rekindle with great appetite, friendship. I hope everyone has a lovely day. Thank you for joining us for this conversation. And if you are in St. Louis, please go see the exhibit assembly required at the Pulitzer Foundation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.